Trevion Henderson is key to Ohio State success during the second half of the season. You are Locked On Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in, Buckeye fans, to a Monday edition of Locked On Buckeyes, your daily Ohio State podcast, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day here on Monday, October 21st in the year 2024. I'm your host, Jay Stevens, also the host of the Jay Stevens Podcast. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Jim Knowles and Nick Saban find themselves in today's show, as well as Travion Henderson, because once again the injury bug has found its way inside Ohio State's running back room. The latest player during Ryan Day's tenure as a running back to get hurt, Quinshawn Jenkins, hasn't missed any time. But the last game he played was his worst game in the Scarlet and Gray. The rumor is that Quinshawn Jenkins hurt his hand during Oregon week. During that game, 11 carries, 23 yards, didn't do a lot of things good on the football field that day. He underwent a procedure on his hand. The belief is that he won't miss any time. If he misses time or not, you got to call on number 32 more often than you have previously this year. Because number 32 has shown me so far this year he can run outside, he can run between the tackles, and his vision is improved. And that combination is going to be great for Ohio State down the stretch. Let's just say Juckins is able to play, but he's not getting the same amount of carries. Number 32 can step up and take the load. He can have more on his plate. He has shown everybody pass pro, run blocking, running between the tackles, whatever you need him to do. He is going to get the job done. And I think it's a breath of fresh air for Carlos Lachlan and for Ryan Day that if Travion Henderson needs to have more on his plate, he can handle it. He is also someone that's been hit by the injury bug during his time at Ohio State. But during his best year, at least by the play on his eyes, maybe not statistically so far, but by the way he is playing on the field, he is showing that his body is durable. He's getting a lot of things done, and he's not afraid to use his body in a physical way on the field. Lachlan loves this stuff, man. I love it, too. If I'm Lachlan coming to Ohio State and you get to coach a guy in his fourth year who broke records during his freshman year that were once held by Maurice Claret, that all of a sudden now he is showing he is more of a well-rounded running back than he was previously, and now you're you're leading Russia so far this year. He might not be able to play and have the same effect on the field that he had previously. You're so happy you have number 32. Now, some of you may be wondering, Jay, does that mean more for Howard in the run game? Or does it mean more for Mecca Buka in the run game? Or maybe it be James Peoples? I don't know. It might lean more on a Buka because if you put a Buka in the backfield for any reason, what does that do? get another fast guy on the field and Brandon Ennis. And so I think for Ohio State, they're going to try to figure out some things there as far as do you use James Peoples more? Do you not use him more? Do you use a Buka? What about Patrick Gerd? Because this is a guy, number 49, that we have seen when he is on the field, he is very successful. He is impact is felt every single time he is out there. Now, Patrick Gerd is not a running back, so it's not going to replace Juckins. But let's just say Juckins likes a lead blocker, because I think every running back loves a lead blocker. Let Patrick Gerd be that guy. If we see more of that of the normal Ryan Day 12 personnel where you're running the ball with the starting tight end, may it be G. Scott Jr., and then also you bring in more of an H back in Patrick Gerd, I think that's a wrinkle that Ohio State really hasn't shown much this year. I'm surprised they didn't try it against Oregon as they were struggling in the second half to have success on the ground. You bring in Patrick Gerd, who's been successful at spots that he's out there. That may have been a wrinkle that, hey, that may have been something that helped Ohio State run the ball against Oregon's defense in the second half, which I think that would have helped Will Howard out a lot as the later he got into the game, more was put on Will Howard's shoulders, more was put on his plate. And what do we find? Ohio State kind of leaned on him to do everything in that game in the second half offensively, and we saw how that went. Well, Howard had a good game. He wasn't the reason the game was lost, but, man, having more on the ground in that game but trying to find some ways to be more creative in the run game in the second half of that game would have drastically helped. 
Will Howard be successful in that game? But I do think number 32 is ready for more on his plate this year. No matter if Quinshawn Junkins had an injury or not, I think number 32 has showed you he can handle more. He is ready for more. Doesn't matter if it's more in pass pro or more running between the tackles or whatever they need him to do. Trevion Henderson is ready to step up and be a bigger impact for Ohio State. It's kind of He's going to do whatever you need him to do, which is what kind of mindset he needs and Ryan Day wants him to have. Whatever the team needs from him going forward, he is going to be a guy to get that done. And that makes me kind of excited about what Ohio State might be down the stretch offensively because let's just say Junkins has to miss time. As far as not miss time, well, let's say he's not getting the same amount of carries as he was previously, or he is more of a situational guy versus a guy who's out there in any situation. Junkins, excuse me, Henderson can be a guy that can just step up and take more of the load. Don't have to worry about putting number 20 in. Because James Peebles hasn't played that much. I was looking at the numbers so far this year, and he he won't get redshirted because he's already played more than four games. But he has 35 carries, 153 on the ground, two touchdowns, which is better than I originally thought before pulling the numbers up. But comparing that to the number of snaps that the top two guys have had and knowing that Peoples has only played five of Ohio State's six games, I think that's a big reason why it's more 32. Number 32 is a guy than trying to move up number 20. Now, granted, against Nebraska this weekend, Ohio State's 23.5 point favorites. I have not even tried to dive into projecting what might happen in that game. But my gut says at some point in this game, James Peoples is going to play. Cool. That's great. Getting some more reps. But when you're talking about Penn State down the road, it's going to be weird. I'm about to make this statement. Talking about Indiana down the road. Michigan down the road. Are those games James Peoples plays? Probably not. But those are games that number 32 can shine. And that's what I'm looking for right now from Travion Henderson. I am looking for Travion Henderson to shine when he's on the field down the stretch because that's what he can do. That's what he should do. He is the kind of guy that has shown he can get the job done. And for Ohio State's offense down the stretch, we all know Jeremiah Smith and Abuka, and I think Tate will probably get more of the pie in the passing game as well. All that is great. But what we know is that to win championships and to win big games, you win those games, winning the battle in the trenches on offense and on defense and on the great Ohio State teams and the great Ohio State runs. Think about Ohio State in 2014, running the way to the national championship, beating Oregon or Ezekiel, not Ezekiel Elliott, or uh, Trey Sermon in that run in 2020 from the Big Ten championship game to the game against Clemson. What do you find in big games? The team that wins the battle in the trenches wins the game. And Trevion Henderson knows that. Ryan Day knows that. Urban Meyer preaches it all the time. All the greats know it. You and I know it. And so if that's true, and we believe it is, call on number 32. He's going to get the job done. And that's not something I thought I was going to say prior to the start of the season. But Trevion Henderson has shown me and he's shown you he is capable of having more on his plate and getting the job done. What I think Ohio State's defense is capable of is getting more pressure on the quarterback, and that is going to be needed down the stretch of the season. This episode is brought to you by Ziba Alex Pre Alcohol. Ziba Alex Pre Alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Pre-alcohol produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Z-Biotics your first drink of the night. Drink responsibly and you'll feel your best tomorrow. For your best results, make pre-alcohol your first drink of the night. 
pace yourself, hydrate, and get a good night's sleep, and always wake up feeling refreshed and ready to take on the day. Go to zbiotics.com slash locked on college to learn more and get 15% off your first order when you use locked on college at checkout. Zbiotics is back with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash locked on college and use code locked on college at checkout for 15% off. Thank you for making Locked on Buckeyes your first listen every day. Anytime one of the great coaches in our sport speak, I listen. Urban Meyer, uh, Bobby Bowden, Nick Saban, whoever that great coach is, if he's a legend, I am listening. And Nick Saban was recently on the Pat McAfee show on Friday there in Austin, Texas. And he talked about Ohio State's defense and the game against Oregon. And Pat McAfee kind of prompted the conversation. And, of course, Nick Saban is not going to hold back with sharing his analysis. And Nick Saban talked about Ohio State's defense and the lack of pressure that they got against Oregon. And if you want to look back at the numbers throughout any period during the past few years on Ohio State's defense, you will see that the defense has trouble consistently getting pressure on the quarterback. Some of you might follow the PFF grades, and they say against Oregon, Ohio State had pressure on 40% of Oregon's dropbacks. I didn't see it. You may have seen it. Let me know. Hop on the comment section on the YouTube. Uh, hit me up on Twitter. I don't know because I don't think I saw it. I don't think you saw it either. But it kind of opened my eyes to something that not only is Nick Saban seeing this and he was right with his analysis, but this is a problem. This is a massive problem that I don't know if it's you're able to solve this during an off week. So as I know, you're going up against Nebraska this week. Then Ohio State has Penn State the week after that. And then I don't know the order of these final games. Northwestern, Indiana, Purdue, and Michigan are down the stretch in November. I don't know the order, but I do know this. It don't matter if you're going up against Drew Aller or maybe against Indiana's backup if Curtis Work is not back. Or maybe it's Jack Tuttle. I don't know who it is, but if you're not getting pressure on the quarterback, you're going to be struggling. Now, Ohio State, Kate McNamara, previously against Iowa, did some okay things, but Ohio State also got a decent amount, some okay pressure, okay pressure, Aiden Childs. The moment they hit Aiden Childs, game was over. Now, the previous quarterbacks prior to that, those quarterbacks, out like Marshall quarterback tried to do a little bit once he started hitting him. Game over. Now, if Ohio State started getting pressure earlier and starts hitting the opposing quarterback earlier, what are you going to find? That the opposing offense is not going to have much success because these quarterbacks have already shown you once they get hit once or twice by Ohio State's defense, they're kind of cooked. Now, Dylan Gabriel is a little bit different, but I don't think Dylan Gabriel got touched. Like, I don't, I, I don't know as far as uh, pressures and things like that. I don't know. I don't think he got touched, which is a problem. We're talking about problems that Ohio State has, and I want to be as positive as I can be here on this Monday on game week after not having a game last week. I want to be as positive as I can be. But unfortunately, when it comes to Ohio State's defense and not getting pressure, when Nick Saban talks about it, it kind of hits different. If I talk about it, if you talk about it, like it hits hits in a massive, massive way. If Saban says it, if Urban says it, it hits a little bit different. And I do think Nick Saban saying that, he called Ohio State's defense antiquated. And that's not normally a word that you use to describe Ohio State's defense or you want to be used to describe the Buckeyes' defense. But right now, Ohio State's trying to do so much in coverage that rushing forward and the way they're trying to put forward to the quarterback, it's not getting it done. And now being a little bit more creative on defense and being more, more multiple, it's hurting them. This is also a conversation we have been having for years that Ohio State's defense is not creative enough. It's not using all the multiple looks that they could be using for any reason. And that's a problem. That's a massive problem. Now, maybe some of that is the players. Now, I'm not going to say it's all on the players because we have seen from previous Ohio State players that some guys do certain things at Ohio State. Then they get to the NFL and it's a different story and we are sitting here looking and wondering 
Why in the world did Ohio State not utilize them like they should have? And I, I don't know. It's a, it's a question I have. But as I look at Ohio State's numbers and the stats for the year, I'm kind of confused. Well, Ohio State's played six games. Jack Sawyer has two and a half sacks. Those are also the only tackle for loss that he has this year. Um, Arvo Reese has two TFLs, zero sacks. Talik Williams has two TFLs, one and a half sacks. Tuim Beloa has five TFLs, three sacks. CJ Hicks, one and a half TFLs. Those are also his sacks. You would expect, and I do, I had a belief going into the year that through six games, you would have at least one guy with over five sacks and someone else right behind him. Maybe it was Tuim Beloa, maybe it was Sawyer. I'm not sure which path I would be leaning. I think Tuim Beloa is more athletic than Sawyer, but I don't, I'm kind of confused as to. Why Ohio State is using them this way, is it the players or is it the scheme? I'm kind of leaning more towards the coaching because before Knowles got here, it wasn't like Ohio State was using these players the right way. Think about Jonathan Cooper. Think about Baron Browning. What they're doing in the NFL is great. Did Ohio State properly use them? No. Justin Hilliard has won in 2020. Unfortunately, he had an injury play career at Ohio State. But once he was healthy, he showed you he should be on the field. Uh, Tough Borland, I, I, I'm sure Tough, I've never met Tough Borland. I'm sure he is a great guy. I'm not knocking him as an individual. But that year in 2020, he was not one of the top three linebackers at Ohio State. It didn't take long to realize that. Didn't take long to realize that his skill set, the way that he played the game, what made him one of the Buckeyes' top three linebackers? But he was still the Mike, and what did you find? There were still issues. So I do believe that some of it may not be even be scheme, may not even – now, scheme goes into coaching, but sometimes you may change the scheme and say a player still can't do something. Maybe a guy wants to use a spin move in certain situations, and you're saying no. And you were saying that when he came into Ohio State under a different defensive coordinator. Then all of a sudden now the scheme has changed. Here's a new defensive coordinator. And you're still saying, no, you can't move, use this move. You can't use that move. But when that player uses said moves, it works. But all of a sudden it's, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. So I'm not sure if it's scheme and maybe coaching because I am really wondering if Ohio State is properly using players. And it's not just D-line rotation. It's just using them and letting them play ball. Because one of the best things about defense, yeah, everybody has an assignment. If you're the three-tech or the one-tech or if you're an outside linebacker, whatever position, you have your assignments. You have your keys. If you're a defensive end, you know on an option or any play you're supposed to set the edge. And we know that there was a play when Dylan Gabriel scored uh, when he scored the touchdown in the fourth quarter. What happened? It was a read option, and Tua Maloa went. He went right for the running back, and with him going right for the running back, Dylan Gabriel saw that big old massive hole from where Tua Maloa used to be. He went for JT was not went to the end zone, and so everybody has assignments. But sometimes on foot on on defense, baby, you're just playing free. You are just not playing. And just making making up your own tune, making up your own beat, but you're playing free, man. You got your assignment, but you're reading and reacting, keeping your assignment in mind. But man, it's so much fun playing defense. I loved when I played defense, playing football, and you know we all play pickup ball, play it across the street, flag football as adults. Because one thing I learned when I became an adult and I had my own insurance and I was paying them my own medical bills. Hey, man, I ain't playing tackle football when I got to a certain age. No, because what did that mean? More money could come out of my pocket to pay for these medical bills. I am cool playing flag football. I was cool running. I was cool doing all this stuff. But, man, I was at an age where I am not trying to pay. And I'm not trying to I'm not trying to just let somebody without no pads on just hit me like that. No, I'm not a boxer. I'm not doing a UFC fighting. I'm not doing – I'm not a wrestler. I'm not doing none of that stuff at this age. What would I do? I play flag football. Hey. Pull my flag. It's way better than you trying to take my legs out. So that was defense. Defense is fun. It's free. But sometimes people try to keep you inside of a box. When you try to keep somebody inside of a box, y'all might backfire. And my hope going forward is that Ohio State's defense, let these guys just play free. Put the right guys on the field, one. But also let them play free. 
And while thinking about Ohio State's guys playing free, Jim Knowles comes into mind. Because down the stretch of the second half of the season, my eyes and probably your eyes are watching to see what Jim Knowles does at this defense. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to your, see your favorite teams play live even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. The Buckeyes are back on the field this Saturday. It is homecoming weekend. Nebraska's coming to town after their beatdown that they got by the Hoosiers of Indiana. Nebraska's going to be hungry. We're hungry to watch Buckeye football. The Buckeyes are hungry to get back on the field. That's a great reason to go to the game. Now, maybe you're trying to find a place to find last-minute tickets, a place that has all-in price, and you, can get, and you can get a panoramic view from your seat, and they got the lowest price guarantee, that's game time, and they help you take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time Picks. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. Thank you for making Locked On Buckeyes your first listen every day. Maybe you're a person that has seen things go around on Twitter and their stats about Jim Knowles during the games that he has lost being the Buckeyes defensive coordinator. The numbers aren't great, man. Ohio State's defense gives up a lot of yards in those losses. Fourth quarter, they have not forced a punt in those losses when Jim Knowles is here. It's not fun to think about. It's not fun to think about. There was a lot of hype coming around when Jim Knowles was hired saying, oh, Jim Knowles is going to bring this in. Jim Knowles is going to bring that in. And Jim Knowles has brought a lot of stuff in. The defense has improved. But one thing that has been very, very confusing is, well, the defense has improved. But the Buckeyes are losing big games. And at times, these are games Ohio State should win. I am not going to dive into the stuff with the team up north that takes too much time right now. But those are games that, under Jim Knowles' watch, the Buckeyes' defense, what the bet? Didn't get it done. Georgia. Georgia made plays down the stretch where Ohio State's defense failed multiple times. Didn't get it done against Oregon. The defense Messed up a lot in that game. Gave up, gave up a lot of yards. Allowed Dylan Gable to make a lot of plays. Like we said previously, didn't get pressure on the quarterback. That's a problem. I mean, we're talking about things right now with Ohio State's team, Missouri. Now, you only give up 14 points. There are guys that on Ohio State's offense and defense that, were not, that weren't playing that would normally play. I get that. But even in that game, you're looking and saying, Ohio State, I know this guy hadn't played much. But he should be able to do some things here. They weren't getting it done. And I'm watching Jim Knowles. Because Jim Knowles right now, I don't, I wouldn't say he's on the hot seat. But that seat's warming up. And now it's sometimes a little odd in year three. Some of the things that happened in year one, year two were kind of pushed away or not kind of, they weren't looked into because the team was doing some good things. And people didn't really want to, didn't really go back and look into some of the things that happened under their nose watch because, well, the team was 11 wins, making the playoff at times. Like, it's cool. Like, things are okay. But as people start to dive into what you're doing at Ohio State, I know people are saying Knowles has to go. Okay, cool. Like, if Knowles has to go, there's a reason why. If Knowles stays, there's also a reason why. And the reason why Knowles has a chance to stay past this year, because I'm not saying he's going to stay and be the D.C. next year. I have not seen enough yet to say he's going to be the DC next year. But if Jim Knowles starts to be a little bit more creative and tighten up some of these defensive rotations um, and play some of the right guys all the time, I think we're going to find is the defense is fine. The defense is talented. I have no problem saying the defense is talented as one of the best, uh, the most talented units in the country. I have no problem saying that. What I do have a problem with is the way they're using some of these players, some of the calls that are made, um, situationally, just wetting the bed. I don't normally use that phrase, but that's just a phrase I can use right now to describe what's going on at, right now at Ohio State in some of these situations because the Buckeyes are truly just wetting the bed, man. It's bad. It is bad sometimes on defense. 
it's kind of it's quite embarrassing at times on defense when you watch and see what's going on. You're saying, I know that guy can make that play. I know Ohio State's defense knows better than this call on this time. Why is it happening over and over and over and over? It's kind of like if Ohio State's team starts to fail, people start looking at Ryan Day. With the way the defense is played in big games and in times when Ohio State's played good enough to win, but the team is the defense is wet in the bed. You look at Jim Knowles against Georgia. Yeah, it was a missed field goal at the end of the day. But what do we look back at? The defense. Shroud played out of his mind that day. Will Howard played good against Oregon. What was the biggest problem, even bigger than the lack of run game in the second half? The defense as a whole. I ain't even going to put on lack of pressure. It was the defense. And that is not something I thought we would be saying here on the – Monday of Nebraska week, it was that the defense was a problem at Ohio State in big games. But it's not just big games. Ohio State found ways to get turnovers. So I I think it was against Iowa, second half, they just took over the game. Buckeyes came out with a touchdown. Then the Buckeyes had a turn, forced a turnover. Buckeyes scored. They forced a turnover. Buckeyes scored, forced another turnover. Game was over against Marshall. I think, yeah, game number three. No, Michigan State. Excuse me. Michigan State was game four. What do you find against Michigan State? Ohio State's defense kind of allowed Michigan State to do way more than anybody thought they were going to in the first half. Second half, scoreless. Against Marshall, what do you find? Marshall found a way to kind of expose the Buckeyes' secondary. That's game three, game four. The game five is a little bit different because, I mean, Iowa did it a little bit, but once you shut, shut down Caleb Johnson, it's Iowa's offense ain't doing nothing. Like, he is the offense. He is the person that makes the engine move, and once they shut him down, it was game over. So I, I'm not really going to put much stock into that game. But game number six, once again, what was it? Wasn't just a secondary, defense as a whole. So maybe Marshall was the unit this year that exposed the Buckeyes' defense for some of the flaws. But it's Oregon that opens the eyes to a lot of people about what Jim Knowles has done as a defensive coordinator at Ohio State. Has he drastically improved the defense? Absolutely. Does he need to show more? Absolutely. Both of those things are true. And for me, as we go down the rest of the year, I'm watching Jim Knowles. I want to see more from the defense. This defense should not have issues getting pressure on the quarterback. True Maloa and Sawyer should have more sacks. There should be more tackles for loss. Caleb Downs, maybe this is a time for him to just take over and just do what Caleb Downs does on the football field. Lathan Ransom, I'm looking at you. Denzel Burke, I'm looking at him. Not saying Burke is trash. I know he had a bad game against Oregon, but how is he going to bounce back? Davidson Egbenosin, how does he, like, the fact that he got spit, a, 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 a boy from, well, Treshawn Holden spit in his face, and he didn't try to fight him? That's a Big shock to me, but also Igbenosa, I'm looking at you. How do you respond after the Oregon loss? How does everybody respond to that defense, and how do the coaches respond? I'm also looking at James Laronitis because I am curious, and I don't know the answer to this. Is Laronitis in charge of some of these linebacker rotations? You would assume so, but maybe Jim Knowles is saying, hey, it's your first year as a coach. I'm going to handle this, and Knowles is in charge of what linebackers play. Whoever it is, y'all got to fix this thing, man, because at some point in time, Arvo Reese got to play more because there's no reason why he should have played only two plays against Oregon. None. Not at all. Is he young? Yes. Should he play once again? Yes. The Buckeyes defense, I'm looking at that unit. I want more from that unit. I want better play from that unit all around. I also need to see more from Jim Knowles. My eyes are on him. And my gut says your eyes are on Jim Knowles, too. Thank you for making Locked on Buckeyes your first listen today. For your second listen, check out the Locked on Big Ten podcast. Craig Sheeman is a guy that puts the Big Ten first. When everyone else overlooks it, find Locked on Big Ten on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter at jstevens07. Send every email to jstevens317 at gmail.com. This has been Locked on Buckeyes on a Monday. We'll see you next time.